Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Welcome back, bosses. This is Sam Marks. I'm joined here with Derek in California. Actually, not here, Derek. I, I'm, I'm used to us being together uh, most recently in the Ukraine, and uh, I feel like we're together because we're always on video, but actually, I'm, I'm a whole continent apart. I'm sitting in, in Andorra right now. Well, see, this is the thing. You guys don't tell me anything. As far as I knew, I thought you were still in Barcelona. What brought you to Andorra? I'm running short on my days to be in, in the Schengen area in the EU. Uh, uh, so f- quick, funny story is I need to be in Spain for a wedding uh, in, in late September. I also have some friends and family coming over, but I'm almost up on my, on my 90 days. So I, I had booked a trip um, actually with a previous guest, Kevin Shea, to go to Iceland this week. And as I was getting up at five in the morning to catch my flight to Iceland, I just happened to check uh, to, to confirm that it's outside of the Schengen area, which I had believed it was. It turns out it wasn't. It's out of the <laughs> EU, but it's in the Schengen area. So I had this whole trip planned to, to drive around Iceland with Kevin. And uh, the morning of, I'm like, ah, I can't go. So I just canceled. I didn't, I didn't get any money back or anything. Just laid it off. And then I took a bus to Andorra. It was two and a half hours from Barcelona. <laughs> and I'm hanging out here in what looks like Switzerland. And uh, I'm about to go for some fondue after this. It's so funny because you and Johnny both keep trying to convince me to move out of the U.S., but I'll give you one thing. I don't have to deal with any of that. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever my visa is issued for Spain after three years, um, I won't have to deal with this either. But for now, it's kind of a little game that I'm enjoying playing. <laughs> All right. Well, as long as you're enjoying it, uh, be- we're going to do a really quick intro here before we talk to our guests. But Sam, give us give us a really quick update on your visa because it's been kind of an ongoing topic here and we know you had some issues. Any new updates? Not too much. Uh, I, 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 I say I'm playing a game, uh, you know, dancing around the borders in Europe, but actually I think the Spanish uh, government is playing a game with me on my visa <laughs> issuing because they, they are really just trying to see how far they can push me and how much I'm willing to, to bend to try to get this thing done. So um, no, I'm, you know, I'm still waiting. They requested uh, additional documents, which of course have to, to get like notarized and shipped in or uh, mail it in. Um, but that's it. That's it. Uh, it's going to happen, man. And all this pain <laughs> of getting this done is going to be worth it because I'll tell you what, I could not be happier with my decision to move to Barcelona. It's, it's everything that I thought it would be. Uh, it's really, it's, it's really turning out to be a, a fantastic place. I think that to live. So I'm pumped up for it. I'm just going to stay optimistic. Um, and uh, yeah. Toto bien, amigo. Toto bien. Well, that's awesome news. Well, maybe you could uh, sweeten the deal and find someone that uh, likes uh, maybe a piece of fine art to uh, speed up the process. Yeah, what? what send, send it to him in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> give, give him some shares of, of it in Masterworks. But exactly. No, no, so so th- this is actually uh, going to be an awesome episode. We're going to have on Scott Lynn again. Um, he was on a year ago. This is episode 192. I think we had him on 146. Yep. Fact check that, Derek. So we had him on 146 in the middle of COVID. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what has happened to the art as an asset class uh, during COVID. And word on the street is that Masterworks is now the biggest art buyer in the world, if you can believe that. That is a that is a big statement. Um, I think they've they've grown three or four times. Um, again, they're they're a pretty small company, but they are just growing really quickly. And we know when we had Scott on first time, there was a lot of questions um, and a lot of interest from our listeners. And this is one of those asset classes that I'm getting really excited about. This and wine, I think, are going to be my my next two my next two plays for different reasons. But um, you know, it's a fun asset class, but also it's got, it's got great history and, and performance. So, yeah, so we're going to have on Scott and I think, um, you know, Derek's going to do the interview and then we're going to have a, a long discussion afterwards. And we're also going to talk a little bit about NFTs, Derek. We should know about NFTs. Uh, I think uh, Scott, from what I was doing a little research, has some interesting opinions on NFTs. So I'll definitely bring that up. And I think it's a great time to talk about this asset. You know, last year when we talked to Scott, craziness was going on. It was it was June of 2020. Really, it was kind of 
early pandemic, people didn't know how it was going to shake out. Now we're kind of getting a better idea of things, but at least here in the US, when we record this, Sam, we got this this Delta variant going and more COVID spikes and the markets kind of reacting to it. And this art market seems that it's it's not as correlated to the stock market, uh, typically because the people buying these artworks are not as affected by market swings. You know, they're, they're the really high upper end people like billionaires buying these paintings. Yeah, and if you're a billionaire and you're on and you have to be locked down at your house in Beverly Hills, what better way to spend your time than looking at your Picasso collection? A sip of glass of wine and stare at your Picasso. <laughs> and, and drinking a ten thousand dollar bottle of wine, you know. Live in Sam's dream. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk to Scott. He's the CEO of Masterworks and see what he has to say about all this and where things are looking in the art market. Let's hear it from Scott and Derek. I'm joined here with Masterworks CEO, Scott Lynn. Scott, welcome back, I should say, to Invest Like a Boss. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me back. I think it's, uh, it's been over a year now. Yeah, just over a year. The last time we talked, Sam interviewed you, and it was June of 2020. So, you know, like mid-COVID craziness. I don't think anyone knew what was going on. It, it was probably just after the market panic. And I'm sure you saw a little bit of a panic in the art market as well. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So we we do a lot of studies between correlation of art and other asset classes. Um, we were actually the first ones to publish a correlation study on, on art uh, and how, it, how it's correlated or uncorrelated uh, to the S&P. And what we concluded, I think, it, I think it must have been at the end of 2019, for the first time ever, was that art was a non-correlated asset class. And you know, COVID really, really tested that uh, that hypothesis. So we went into COVID thinking art prices would not fall. All of our research suggested that, and and what we we learned, thankfully, was that was that they didn't. So really, you know, throughout the entire entire COVID uh, process or the pandemic, we we just saw art prices continue to be non correlated, go up effectively as, as public equities were volatile. Um, but that was so, that was definitely an interesting time to go through. So so what was the hypothesis to that? Is is it that you know basically essentially we're saying that the top one percent are buying these paintings anyway, so they're the most least affected by you know a down market. Yeah. And you know, you know, COVID was really interesting because the the unique thing about the art market is that it's a global asset class, right? You can you can buy a $10 million painting in New York and you can sell it in Hong Kong. So anything that's country specific doesn't usually tend to impact the art market. But COVID was one one of the first global global crises that that we had seen um, on that sure. scale. So we we really didn't know what to expect. Yeah, it's definitely interesting, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that prices at least stabilize and I'm assuming are back to growing as the economy is kind of kicking back together. Can you just give us a, a kind of a current state of Masterworks as it stands? You know, you're, you're still a, a pretty new company and you're, you're pioneers in this space. So where does the company stand right now? You know, uh, how much are you holding in assets? How many investors do you have? Um, and how does that maybe compare to a, a year ago, I guess, before everyone was sitting at home locked up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the business has, has grown tremendously over the past year. I think I think we have um, nearly two hundred thousand investors in the platform now. Um, I can't I can't even recall what that was roughly roughly a year ago. Um, this year we'll buy somewhere between uh, three and four hundred million dollars in art. So we've now become the largest buyer in the art market. Um, you know, in, in terms of AUM, we're we're over over two hundred million now. Um, you know, really growing three, four hundred percent a year at this point. So it's, it's been, uh, you know, things have things have changed dramatically since, uh, since I guess a year, year and a half ago. So can you give us maybe a little bit of, if this is too inside info, you know, just let me know. But what's what's kind of the average amount that you see an investor going in with? But uh, essentially, when we see these platforms, someone will start with a lower amount, and you know, if they like what, what they see, they'll they'll go in with higher. Uh, what's kind of the average, maybe maybe starting amount that someone will, will dip their toes in, and what what do you maybe see after after they're uh, a part of Masterworks for a while? Yeah, it's you know, it's definitely changing over time. So so I would say that in the beginning, we were seeing investors invest hundreds or, or low single digit thousands. Um, today, we're probably seeing the average investor invests somewhere between, you know, three and ten thousand dollars to start. 
and then and then growing that that allocation over time. That's great info. So how many paintings or I guess I guess I guess everything's a painting, correct? Uh, everything's a painting. Yeah. So today people are, are picking and choosing which paintings to invest in. So they're, 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 you know, looking at individual works from well-known artists like Basquiat, um, Warhol, uh, emerging artists like Cecily Brown or Jonas Wood. Um, and they're picking and choosing which, which paintings to invest in similar to how you would pick or choose stocks uh, to invest in. Okay, great. I just want to make sure I'm getting the right vocabulary in there. So how many how many average paintings does does an investor hold? Are, are they are they going all in on one or are they kind of spreading it out to a, a basket of different pieces of art? You know, it really depends on the investor, but but diversification in the asset class matters just like it does in in any asset class. So we like to see people investing in a half dozen, uh, ten paintings over time. Great. So uh, I want to bring up something that, that you said your uh, Masterworks is now the largest art buyer in the world. Yeah, so we we think at this point we're we're the biggest buyer in the art market, um, and and you know really to contextualize that the dynamic dynamic that you've had in the art market for years are really ultra wealthy families primarily that are buying and trading these these ten twenty thirty million dollar paintings um, on a global basis. So you know we're we're really the first firm to come into the art market in a big way. Uh, with with a pool of investment capital and and really use that to to buy paintings across large numbers of artists. That's actually perfect because I wanted to jump into the buying process next. And uh, how do you see that uh, affecting when you're going to purchase a piece of art? Does someone come in? You know, let's take an example. Like I have a a Warhol, but Masterworks is asking for it, and you know what? They're a huge buyer, so I know that maybe I can squeeze a little bit extra out of them. Do you, do you maybe run into that issue now that you've gotten too big? <laughs> I think it's I think it's I think it's almost the opposite, right? I mean, we're we're obviously very uh, non-emotional buyers, right? Like we we buy based on data and, and and price, so we you know we don't we don't really chase objects. I mean, you you really see individual collectors or ultra high net worth individuals chase objects, right? It's the it's the typical example of a of a multi billionaire who really wants to own a trophy object who just doesn't care if they overpay by ten million dollars like that that's generally when you see see overpaying in the art market so it's not it's it's not it's not us doing that that's that's kind of what I wanted to ask too so I'm assuming uh, some of your your paintings are bought in an auction process and I you know I would assume your team whoever is placing those bids has, you know, a max, max amount, which no matter what, even if it's a dollar more, do not go over that amount. Yeah. So, you, you know, when I was on the show last time, like a hundred percent of the paintings that we were buying, I think probably were at auction. Uh, today it's, it's relatively, I mean, it's becoming smaller and smaller. So somewhere between 20 and 30% of paintings we're buying are, are from auction. Uh, roughly a third is direct from collectors and a third uh, is through through intermediaries, whether those are galleries or whether those are art advisors. Um, so we're we're starting to source a lot more direct, uh, mainly because as, as collectors become aware of masterworks, they're they're coming to us directly. Um, but but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we we have a pretty rigorous process when it when it comes to buying a painting, and I like to describe that as a as a two step process. So step one is is really relying on our research team using proprietary data to understand which segments of the art market are accelerating most quickly. Um, you know, we're really the only research team that exists in the art market to understand returns, as, as crazy as that sounds. So we're the only ones that publish indexes on the art market. Um, we're the only ones that think about things like correlation and loss rates. Like there, there just is no research firm in the art market today that's, that's looking at that, that data. So we, we have a research team dedicated to that. They effectively decide which artist markets or which sub-segments of artist markets are appreciating most quickly. That, that then gets handed off to our acquisitions team that goes out and sources paintings by those particular artists um, that, that meet those criteria. You know, today we're, we're focused on 55 artist markets. I think we've been offered more than $8 billion in work by those 55 artists. And we're purchasing three to four hundred million this year. So it's a pretty it's a pretty selective um, process at this point. So just so we're clear, when, when you say an artist market, that would comprise any piece of artwork from that particular artist. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and it's you know it, it varies. So like the largest artist market is Picasso today. 
Um, you know, Picasso's market will sell but between public and private auctions somewhere around $600, $800 million a year. So his market is so complex. There's sub markets within the market, but, but generally that's, that's correct. Wow. Those are some big numbers. Um, I got to bring this up because it was asked in last time, but uh, it, we keep getting asked it. Um, generally, an artist that's no longer alive, like a Picasso, holds greater value because they can't create any, any new work. Are there any living artists that you're seeing now that, you know, your team is seeing potential for them to, to increase in value? Or is it just simply the case that a deceased artist will always outperform a living artist? No, it's, it's, it's definitely not true, right? So we, we see a lot of, um, a lot of I, I guess, very, um, very well-established living artists that we think are really interesting investment opportunities. You know, these tend to be more well-known living artists. Um, the, the, uh, the one artist that I, I think we were probably early on backing the last time I, on the, I was on the show was Banksy. Um, over the past 12 to 18 months, his market has just totally exploded. You know, I think his, his appreciation is up more than 100% year over year. Um, our research team really identified him early on as, as, as a momentum artist. And, you know, to a lot of your listeners, I, I think that's, that's probably not surprising. But from an art market perspective, it was a really surprising conclusion. Because if you think about Banksy as an artist, there's, there's no art world infrastructure built around him, right? He's an anonymous artist. He doesn't have a gallery. There's, there's, there's no gallery representation. So the, you know, the, the art market machinery that typically makes these artist markets and sustains them just doesn't exist with him. Uh, but we continue to see his prices rise. And I, and I think there's some significance to his pop culture um, dynamic that, that got us comfortable with his market early on. And today, you know, it, it just, it's really taken off. Totally. So I think Banksy can probably avoid this next question I'm going to ask because he is anonymous. <laughs> and um, I did want to bring this up, though, because, you know, at current times, you know, we got to we got to talk about things, things like cancel culture. So if, if you have if you have a living artist and I'm not accusing anybody of anything, I don't I don't know anybody's background, but it, we see this a lot of, a lot of times in Hollywood and in the music business. And it just takes a news story to kind of expose them and their value just plummets. Is there, I don't know if that's really happened in the art market yet or if it, if it will, but is that, is that maybe a cause of concern for a living artist? Yeah, it, it, it definitely is. And it's definitely happened. So I'll give you a real world example of, of an artist market, sure. uh, you know, dropping or, or, or declining. So the artist that, you know, is, is most, is, is, I guess, most associated with this is, is someone named Damien Hurst. Um, so Damien's market is, is just continued to underperform continuously for a number of years. I, I think the, the turning point in that was um, the artist directly, uh, the, the, art, the artist decided directly, really right after the financial crisis, right? I can't recall, I think it was maybe going into, yeah, it was, the, it was the first major, it was the last major auction before the financial crisis, decided to start selling his work directly uh, via auction at Sotheby's to collectors, really bypassing intermediaries, um, sort of, sort of, you know, sidestepping a lot of collectors that he had he had worked with before and helped help build his market. And the art world infrastructure kind of abandoned him effectively, right? A lot of people stopped backing him after he uh, really tried to go around them. So that, you know, that's an example of a living artist who had you know, huge market, billions of dollars in, in total market value that really, um, really hurt it through, through his own, his own actions. That's really interesting. I just kind of did a quick Google search on that too. So he, he made that move in September of 2008. So really interesting timing there too, with the state of the economy at that point. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I was, I was trying to go back in my, my memory and remember that, but yeah, I think it was the last kind of big auction before everything fell apart. All right. Really good to know. So Masterworks buys these works and you got to put them somewhere. So where are these stored? I think you also have a showroom in New York, right? Yeah. So we, we, we have a gallery in New York. I mean, we're, you know, kind of, uh, kind of moving away from showing things ourselves since the business is just getting so big to, um, to really relying on museums and institutions to exhibit works um, on, on our behalf or that, that we loan to them. Uh, you know, a lot of the art today still does, does sit in storage. I mean, we really haven't seen the art world entirely reopen post uh, post COVID, but you know, we, we expect it to uh, in the coming, coming months. 
Cool. And can Masterworks investors come to your gallery and check out some of the works that they might be investing in? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we we try to um, kind of make it by appointment only anymore. So if someone's a member on the platform, they can just request uh, through their through their membership rep to uh, to come see the paintings. Awesome. And so, what type of, of insurance are you holding on these on these paintings? Any type of guarantee for investors that let's say one uh, potentially gets damaged or stolen, and has that ever happened before? Yeah, so all, all the paintings are are insured. Uh, they're they're held in fine art fine art storage. So if something something happened, an investor would would kind of get the uh, the appraised value back. Um, it's never happened. You know the the way that you handle these paintings is incredibly uh, incredibly delicate. You know they're they're created. They're stored in temperature controlled facilities. They're only uncreated and handled by professionals. Uh, the, the the whole process is. Uh, is very careful. All right. That's really good to know. So let's jump into the, the actual investment aspects of uh, getting into art. Now your site all over, I think if you, if you did a control F search, the most popular search term is probably gonna be blue chip art. So explain mm -hmm. what blue chip art means. Yeah. You know, there's different definitions for blue chip art. Like when we use the term blue chip art, we're really referring to the top 100 artists by transaction volume. Um, and those are, those are mostly household name artists. So they're artists like Basquiat, Picasso, Warhol, um, you know, names that, that people would, would, would know. Great. Has there been stock uh, talk of creating a, a fund maybe to invest in, in a, a kind of a basket of these artists, maybe like an index fund of sort? Yeah, we, we do. Um, we do think there's a role for a fun product um, with, with within the platform. Um, you, you know, we've been growing so fast. We haven't uh, we haven't been able to release it yet, but it is something that we hope to do probably, you know, sometime next year. Uh, and that that effectively would give investors diversification across a number of Masterworks offerings. Um, the, you know, the downside to a fun product, and this is what we struggle with a little bit internally, is is just the the liquidity features, right? So so today you can invest in a particular artwork on the Masterworks website, and then you can effectively go into the secondary market and sell or buy shares in that same artwork. And we we just think that secondary trading, for a whole host of reasons, is is much more complicated with a fund. Um, but lots of people do do like the idea of of a fund. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, I think we're gonna have to have you on next year, though. If that's coming uh, next year for <laughs> a third round. Um, I do want to get into the secondary market in a few minutes, but first, I wanted to ask: um, Are there are there certain artists where you can just bank on? You know, they're gonna con consistently rise and have a nice steady upswing. Um, I wanted to bring it up because you you actually have you have a lot of great data on your site at Masterworks.io, and one artist that kind of stuck out in in these wild price swings, you know, up or down is Andy Warhol where, you know, it's some, some, it looks like a roller coaster on the chart. Is that, is that typical of these bigger artists or what are you seeing out there? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. So look, we, when we, when we think about artist markets, we tend to think about um, very similar data to, to what you would look at in any asset class, right? So we look at return, we look at volatility in return, you know, how predictable is that return? And then we look at effectively risk adjusted return, which, which some of your listeners would think of as like a sharp ratio. So when you, when you look at different artist markets, what you see very quickly is that the higher the return, the more volatility and the lower the return, the less volatility. Um, an artist that I, that I like to use as an example is, is Monet. So Monet's market is super interesting to us in some ways. You know, he's, he's probably one of the lowest returning artists. He only returns six or 7% a year. You know, there's certain segments of his market that return more, but his returns are, are so predictable. It's one of the lowest volatilities that we see on any artist. So his risk adjusted return or sharp ratio is above one. Um, which is pretty incredible for for any asset class. So Monet is almost like buying a, you know, a, a highly rated bond um, in the art market. Now there's there's other artists that that we follow that you know have much higher returns. Like uh, like a Sam Gilliam has returns that today are in the forty percent range, but his volatility is is very high as well. Um, so you know it really depends on the on the segment of the market. Um, in terms of how to think about re return or, or predictability in return. Um, to, to your question about Warhol, though, you know, Warhol is an, is an interesting artist in that his cultural significance, we rank, is probably number one of all time. Um, we, mm -hmm. we think of him as more culturally significant than, than probably any other artist. Uh, he, he has 
I think over the past five years um, struggled from a market perspective because uh, there's been a huge focus on revisiting our history around female artists, African-American artists. A lot of those artists have, uh, have, have really uh, seen their markets rise. You know, Warhol, Warhol doesn't obviously fit that, that criteria. So he's, he's been much quieter, but long-term we're, we're still very bullish on this market. Very cool. So I, I guess you got a little something for everyone, you know, if, if you're more risk averse and, and you, and you like those bonds or those, those big uh, fortune 500 dividend stocks, you know, you go for a Monet, but if you're the type that buys the the AMC or the GameStop stocks, maybe, maybe you look at a Warhol. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> So uh, let's talk about performance since we're relating it to the, the stock market in general. So your, uh, your site claims that uh, this art has been a better performing asset than the S&P 500. So how, how do you determine that data and, and why, why do you see it as a potentially better market than uh, the S&P? Yeah, so our, our, as I mentioned, our research team is the only research team that really uh, does research on on appreciation in the art market. Um, we when we look at appreciation rates and when we do index construction, we follow a very similar methodology to what Case Schiller does for home prices, um, which is a pretty popular uh, index for for real estate appreciation. So we we're, we're looking at specific times that paintings have been bought and sold at public auction over a number of decades, and we're using those individual returns to construct indices in the art market um, by segment to, to, to inform us on how the art market is appreciating and how it's, how it's correlated to other asset classes. And I think what you see very quickly when you look at, at art market data, and, and we, by the way, have, have partnered with almost every major private bank at this point and their research teams to publish thought leadership, um, help them think through, through art as an asset class. And, and I think they've come to similar conclusions. So contemporary art, which we define as art created after World War II, has appreciated exactly 14% a year for the past 25 years from 1995 through 2020. Um, that's better than the S&P. That's better than real estate. That's better than gold. Uh, when you look at correlation rates between uh, art and the S&P in particular, it's effectively a non-correlated asset class. The correlation rate is less than 0.1, meaning that if the S&P increases, you shouldn't necessarily expect art prices to increase and vice versa. So it acts as a nice diversifier for a portfolio. Um, we also look at loss rates. How, how common is it to, to lose money if you buy a very expensive blue chip painting? What percentage of the time that people purchase these paintings? Do they, do they subsequently sell them um, at a loss? And, and I think all of the characteristics combined make it a very compelling strategic asset class. The, the issue is that historically, the only way to allocate to the asset class is if you have millions of dollars to buy a painting or tens of millions of dollars to build a portfolio. So it really hasn't even been a topic of, of discussion. Um, you know, one of my favorite examples on, on this is actually Citigroup, who our research team, team works with a lot and we, we've published some, some thought leadership on. So Citigroup in 2015 was the first firm ever to do an asset allocation model on art asking the question, how much should an investor actually allocate to the asset class? And I'm not, I'm not sure why they, they chose to do that in 2015. My, my understanding from talking to people there is that some of the people within the research team actually just had an interest in art. And they concluded that investors should allocate between 1.4 and 4% to art uh, depending on their tolerance for, for illiquidity. Now, the interesting thing about that conclusion is twofold. One is that they focused on all art, not just contemporary art. And contemporary art performs much better than segments of the art market like old masters, impressionist, or modern artists. The second thing that, that I find that I find really amusing is that they came to this conclusion, but there were no, there were no, there were no investment products to invest in, right? So the only way you could actually allocate is to buy. A multi-million dollar painting. So they so they stopped publishing the asset allocation model after that because it, it just wasn't practical. That that actually makes a lot of sense because before a company like Masterworks was around, you know, 1.4 to 4 percent of your portfolio, if you're spending a million dollars on a painting, that's a that's a very high portfolio <laughs> that most people yeah. do not have. Yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a portfolio of a billionaire, right? <laughs> exactly. So so this is cool that you you're you know you're you're opening this market to to a lot more people that never had access to this until just a few years ago now. So the average 
hold time, I want to get into that. You claim it's three to seven years. So I think Masterworks is about four years old now, if I'm correct. Yeah. So we, we tell investors to think of these as three to 10 year holds. Um, that's changing a little bit because we have secondary markets now. So, so investors don't necessarily need to wait for us to sell the painting in order to, to exit their position. Um, but we think generally investors should think of these as, as long-term illiquid holds as, as part of their overall, overall portfolio. Great. So let's talk about that secondary market. How does it work and how, how is uh, Masterworks involved in that whole process? Yeah. So you can, you can go to the, um, the website, uh, the masterworks.io website and click on trading and actually see a lot of, a lot of these, these painting specific securities and how they're, they're trending, right? It looks and feels like any sort of trading platform that you would use for public equities, um, but you're you're buying and selling shares and in, in paintings, um, so it's it's really just a uh, you know a way for investors to to exit their positions early, um, to buy more securities in a painting that that they like or they think is going up in value, um, but looks and feels similar to any other trading platform that that you would use. Great, and I I believe this is still the case, but correct me if I'm wrong. Are, are, is each individual share of of a painting still twenty dollars? Yeah, at the IPO, they're they're twenty dollars, and then they they trade, you know, different prices on the secondary market thereafter. And then, are there any additional fees for selling it on the secondary market? We we, we don't charge fees for secondary market. We we really view it as a as a feature for uh, investors to use if they if they want to exit their position. So so today, there's there's no fees. So do you see any kind of, I guess, the, the day traders of art jump into this? You know, they'll, they'll, get, they'll get an IPO of a painting they think is hot and then try to flip those shares once it's sold out? <laughs> you know, we were seeing it more and more. I, I, you know, my, my answer to that question a year ago would have been, would have been no. We, we were definitely seeing some kind of power uh, users of the, of the secondary market today. Um, you know, a new, a new addition to the website or, or I guess just our investment flow is, has been quarterly appraisals. So in addition to um, kind of the prices in the secondary market, investors can or, or have price discovery through um, a section on the website called My Portfolio that basically allows them to see how we think individual shares are appreciating over time. Um, so that, that I think helps investors think about prices in the secondary market as well. Yeah, that's really good to know. So each piece of art gets, gets an updated uh, quarterly uh, appraisal. That's right, yeah. Great. So what type of fees does Masterworks take on, on an, each individual piece of art? What, what can an investor expect uh, Masterworks to pull out of that? Yeah, so our, our management fees are one and a half percent a year um, and twenty percent of the profit when the painting sells. Um, so very similar to to kind of a private equity venture fund type structure. Sure. Um, yeah. Okay, sounds good. We have to bring up NFTs. Last time you were here, it, it was like a thing that maybe only a few people heard of, and you know it's been all over the media. This this big new revolution in digital art, and I, I just want to get your thoughts on that uh, of kind of the NFTs and digital art market and how, and how it compares to where you see the physical art market. Yeah. It's funny. I was, I was on Kramer the other day on CNBC and, you know, he asked this question and you never, when he asks a question, you never exactly know what he's, what he's going to ask. <laughs> and you never, you I never exactly wrote, know. I wrote, I wrote a college paper on Jim Kramer back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. funny enough. <laughs> yeah. So you, so you, so you know what I mean? And then, you know, and then when you answer, you don't know how he's going to react. So thanks. That, thankfully I, I answered the question correctly because he's, he's not a crypto fan, I guess, but um, look, so we, we have very specific opinions on this and I think our opinions are really just just rooted in kind of all of the data that we've seen on the art market literally for decades, um, but but also in the structure of NFTs and, and just, just how to think about exactly what you're buying or what you're quote unquote investing in. So there, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. So the, the first thing that we fundamentally take issue with on in NFTs is just the lack of, of intellectual property that you're purchasing. So at the end of the day, if you're buying an NFT, you are technically buying a digital image that you have no copyright ownership in. And we know this issue very well because if we go out and we buy a $25 million Basquiat, um, at the end of the day, we don't own that copyright. The Artist Foundation owns that copyright. So you know we're not entitled to royalties if images of that painting are reproduced. Similarly, if you buy an NFT with a, with a digital image um, associated with that token, you're not entitled to any royalties or any 
any sort of IP ownership um, based based on that purchase. So, you know, you own the same amount of, of rights to that digital image as I own um, or as anyone owns. So we, you know, we fundamentally are kind of scratching our heads asking what, what are people doing? Like, what are they actually purchasing? And from a legal perspective, they're technically purchasing nothing. So, so that's, that, that's one issue that we have with NFTs. The second issue that we have- Can, with can NFTs, I stop you before we get into that second one? Because this is really yeah. interesting. Uh, explain how, how the copyrights work when you own the physical painting. So from what I'm hearing from you is you, you own this, this, this beautiful Basquiat painting, you spent $25 million on it, but any imaging rights to this, even though you own the physical piece, you don't, you don't get any royalties off that. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So under, under copyright law in the US, those copyrights are owned by the artists themselves or the artist foundation. So they, they don't transfer with the purchase of the object. Um, you know, that could vary outside of the US. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, but within the US, that's, that's certainly the case. So um, yeah, I mean, that, that definitely informs how we, how we think about NFTs. Okay. That's really interesting. Cause I, I didn't know if it, it would be a stupid question, but I was wondering, is it technically possible to make an NFT from a, a physical piece of art? But I guess if you did that, that would fall under the, the copyright imaging anyways. Correct. Yeah, we, we technically couldn't, you know, couldn't do that. We, we, we could be held liable if we if we did. Okay, good to know. Uh, I didn't know that. And I, I'm sure there's a couple other people out there that didn't know that as well, how that all works with, you know, because if you're talking like art, or like music, if you own the masters, to like a piece of music or something, it, it can be completely different. So that's really good to know. Um, yeah. So the, so the second point is just, just a point around cultural significance. And, you know, when we look at art market data, we look at art market data over decades. Um, the, the art market has obviously been around for centuries. I, I tell people often that Sotheby's, um, one of the main auction houses is 275 years old. Christie's is 250 years old. We literally have art market data going back over a century. So we have tons and tons of data of paintings that have have traded uh, at public auction for many, many years. And one thing that we look at is how do art prices correlate to what we define as, as cultural significance? And we, we quantify cultural significance in three different ways. One is what museums or institutions collect which artists, uh, how global is the demand for a particular artist? And then when an artist exhibits, what other important artists do they exhibit with? And one thing that you can, you can see in the data is that if an artist entirely lacks cultural significance, meaning institutions don't collect him, they don't exhibit him, and collectors around the globe are not interested in his or her work, it's very, very, very unlikely. I don't think we've ever seen an example of an artist maintaining price over time. So there can be short bursts of price increases, um, but we don't, you know, we don't think those prices are sustainable. And I think what we're seeing in the NFT space right now is exactly that, right? The, the art world institutions, art historians haven't really recognized these artists. They, they have no cultural significance. So you know, when things are selling for millions of dollars, um, without cultural significance, and frankly, without any any ownership to the actual IP, it just feels like a bubble to us. Great. That's good to know. So I would think that obviously one of the bonuses of owning these pieces of work is to show them off. And, you know, you're not going to, it doesn't display as well if you're just throwing it on a, on a TV screen on the wall. Um, so I think it's pretty safe to say that Masterworks won't be, won't be jumping into the digital art market. <laughs> Yeah, we're not. We 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 get the question all the time, but yeah, it's not it's not for us. All right, good to know. Um, I want to jump into a couple of questions from our, our Patreon group. Uh, these are some of our select listeners that uh, support the show, so I want to make sure we get these in before as well. Um, I got a first question from Ian Arakaki. Uh, he actually says he's a, a customer with Masterworks and has bought several shares in several pieces of art after listening to your last interview on Invest Like a Boss. And he said the website and sign up process were great. Uh, I'm curious to know how many pieces of art Masterworks has actually sold to date and what were the returns on those sales? Now, um, you guys are just a few years old, but you have, you have sold some artwork. Yeah. So we, so we tell investors again, to think of these as three, three to 10 year illiquid holds. Um, so we, we haven't really expected at this point to sell any paintings. Um, again, you, you have access to appraised values, um, which, which can help give a sense for how 
you know, we think, or, or third-party appraisers think the paintings are appreciating. Um, that being said, we did sell one painting six months ago, which was a Banksy painting. I, I mentioned that, you know, Banksy's market was one of them that we identified early on as accelerating quickly. Um, we sold that that work into kind of the, the, the momentum or the activity in Banksy's market. Um, that, that was a 36% uh, return net of fees to investors so that, you know, that, that was a, a good annualized re return. Great. I love it. Uh, Marco Bataglia, uh, we answered most of his questions already, so I won't do all of them. Uh, one simple one we didn't get to is what's the minimum amount uh, to invest in Masterworks? And then he also mentions what's the minimum amount of recommended to see substantial results. I think substantial results is pretty subjective, but uh, I guess what what's the minimum and what, what would you usually recommend uh, someone who's new to the platform to, to invest? Yeah, the, the first question is very easy. So the first question that, you know, there, there is there is no minimum. Um, so it, whenever you, you request access to the platform, you hop on the phone with a membership rep who runs you through suitability and really talks about how you're investing today, what the size of your portfolio is, what your risk tolerance is, and then really... Um, you know, sort of, sort of directs you to the platform where you can pick and choose paintings that meet your investment criteria. Um, so, you, you know, that, that's just a conversation that you can have, have with our team. The, se the second question is, is harder. Um, and we get this question a lot and, and it's a particularly hard question because when you look at the appreciation rate of the asset class, it is appreciating faster than most other major, or, you know, arguably all major, uh, asset classes. So, you know, you can come up with very big allocations to art overall. We always caution against that because, you know, it is, it is a newer asset class for most people. Um, it is a liquid. You, you need to be able to tolerate long investing periods. Um, you know, we're usually seeing people start with kind of low single digit allocations on a percentage basis for a portfolio and then and then building from there. Uh, diversification does matter. Like, like any asset class, it's hard to predict exactly which, which paintings will, will necessarily go up in value you know, over the next six or 12 months. So simply diversifying is a, is a good strategy. Um, but it, you know, the, 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 uh, the total amount to, to invest is a, is, a, is a hard thing for us to recommend. All right, great. So as long as there's no minimums, I know our listeners will love that. And depending on how you answer the next two questions are going to kind of sway them one way or another as well. Uh, do you do you have to be an accredited investor to join Masterworks or can non-accredited join? Yeah, so these are these are all qualified public offerings. So anyone can, can invest. Um, you know, we, we really, when we started the business, we thought that since art is one of these asset classes that people look at and they, you know, they, they tend to think that it's opaque. They tend to think that it's unregulated. Um, you know, we felt like a, a regulated product in terms of an SEC qualified product, which is really in the U.S., the highest uh, threshold of an investment product was important. So investors can read offering circulars on the SEC website. They can read about risks. They can, you know, they, they, they can go through those documents in detail. Um, but that, that is a process that, that effectively allows anyone to invest without being accredited. Great. You're two out of three, Scott. Let's see if you can do all three. <laughs> um, the last question, do you have to be a U.S. citizen to invest in Masterworks or is it open to other countries as well? It is, it is open to other countries. So we, we spent um, a lot of time actually engineering these vehicles to be friendly to non-U.S. Non investors. And the way we did that is we effectively have our, our paintings owned by a Cayman entity that sits outside of the U.S. And then that Cayman entity is a, is a wholly owned subsidiary of a Delaware LLC that's the public vehicle. So um, if you are not a U.S. resident, uh, and, and a painting sells, those gains are effectively taxed in your local jurisdiction rather than having to pass through the U.S. And, and I, you know, out of any investing platform, I think we're the only ones that do this that I'm, that I'm aware of, but it's really a, you know, an absolute requirement for non-U.S. persons because otherwise you can, you can get hit with double taxation between the U.S. and, and your local country. Great. Do you hear that, bosses? Non-accredited, no minimums, and outside the U.S. or inside the U.S., wherever you're at, you can invest. So I don't think there's anything to complain about on this one. <laughs> um, uh, last question before we get out of here, Scott, just a fun question. 
Uh, if you were investing your own money today from an, from an outside perspective, you don't work for Masterworks and you had to pick one piece of art that you currently have listed on the site, what would it be and why would you pick that, that painting? You know, so I'm not, I'm not, since we have a trading market, I can't, I can't comment on specific artworks, but I'm happy to talk about uh, individual artist markets. All right. I'll take that. <laughs> so I think, you know, I think the best, I mean, what, one of the best markets that, that we consistently see um, perform and it's, it's really just amazing is, is Basquiat's market. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that his appreciation rate, you know, depending on the year that you look at is somewhere between 17 and 22% a year for the past, I want to say almost 20, 20 years, um, Basquiat's that were a couple hundred thousand dollars in the early two thousands, the late 1990s sell for, you know, $10 million, $20 million today. And you would think at those price points, you, you would see a slowdown in his market, but we, we just continue to see, see it rise. So he's, you know, he's this interesting example of a market who has very, sorry, of an artist who has very high price points, um, and and you you know you you at this point would be expecting the returns to come down, um, but you know he, he continues to kind of defy all all odds from that that perspective. Great, I love all this info, Scott. I think between this and your last appearance, uh, we have a, we have a really good picture of what Masterworks is all about, and it's a really exciting platform. And your team actually put together a special link that our bosses can go check out. It's masterworks.io slash invest like a boss. Masterworks.io slash invest like a boss. Pretty simple to remember. So if our listeners go there, Scott, what can they expect the signup process to look like? Uh, it's very straightforward. So they, if, they, if they go to that link, uh, I think they can skip, skip the wait list and then uh, basically get on a call with, with someone from our membership team and get an account set up you know, straight away. I love it. All you got to do is head over to masterworks.io slash invest like a boss. Scott's team is going to hook you up so you can buy some pieces of art. Scott, thank you so much for your time on invest like a boss. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. I feel like we could do four or five more episodes on that. There's like, there's just so much good information. It's still such an, a new asset class that we've only talked about twice now, both times with Scott um, and it, it, learning a lot, getting a lot more confidence in the, in, of course, uh, the platform and the ability to, to buy, um, you know, sh- fractional uh, units of the, of these paintings, but also just a lot more confidence in the art market and seeing how it's performing through COVID. And, um, you know, I think there's always going to be that 1%, you know, it's just like, it's like with fine wine. I think there's always going to be that 1% and the, the rich are just going to keep getting richer and this, this market's going to continue to grow. Yeah. You know what? I could have went on for hours with Scott with this. I actually felt kind of bad. I, I went about 10 minutes over time. I was looking at the clock and I was like, all right, I better wrap this thing up. But Scott was really cool and willing to answer these questions. And I, I tried to ask different questions that were asked the last time. So if you want a more complete picture, definitely go back, check out episode 146 and then come back to this episode as well. Um, I think you're right, Sam. So these billionaires are, they're, they're the type of people that if they want something, they're going to get it. It doesn't matter the price. So that's why I was a little bit concerned about, you know, how much is masterworks spending to get these artworks because they know if later down the road, they could flip it for a a higher price uh, in most cases. So it was really good to to kind of hear him say, you know, we know what the market is. We're not emotionally tied to these paintings, so we're not going to overpay. But the idea is when we turn around and sell it, you know, someone's going to be emotionally tied to that because it's more than likely going to a personal collection. I thought that was a great question. And I, and I, I was actually surprised to hear his answer, but it made sense because I had the same thought uh, and I, the, the analogy that you used, like, you know, if, if you own a domain and uh, Derek Sparks writes me and asked to buy the domain. And then on the other hand, I got Google asking me to buy the same domain. Like I'm going to use a much higher figure, right? No offense, it, Derek. That's where my thought went too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense. And this is where I see what Masterworks is. Okay. The, it, it, it has to be a true statement, right? Like billionaires are going to chase these things because they have an emotional attachment and an ego involved in acquiring it. Sorry, billionaires, but you didn't become a billionaire without having a big ego. Exactly. Right? Like, <laughs> I think they're so aware. they're going to chase these things. Whereas Masterworks is more like an institution and they're using, they're just using data and they're buying so much that they're unattached to the outcome, right? They're just making smart purchase decisions. Uh, 
and they have to have an absolute advantage just because of all the data. Like an individual buyer might have two or three people on their team that's doing analysis and stuff, but I bet they're doing it more of like this antiquated, like pen and paper method. Whereas it seems like Masterworks has, has, you know, data team and they're doing things in a much more, um, you know, big data way or big yeah, data format. I, I feel like they're they're ahead of the game where this this is the art market is one of those more old school places where it's it is more maybe more of not necessarily pen and paper, but it's just not as advanced pushing data and analytics and actually mm -hmm. following a science to buy these paintings. And so far it seems to be pretty successful. So that so they've got two hundred thousand investors now. Scott said they're buying between three hundred and four hundred million dollars in art each year and three to four times growth. I'm not sure what the art market is on the whole annually, but three to 400 million seems like a pretty big number. It does until if, if you paid attention and he said, you know, one of the top artists every year is Picasso. Mm -hmm. Picasso averages 600 to 800 million a year alone. That's just one artist. <laughs> Is that insane? Like how many, so insane. how many paintings is Picasso still like, what a legacy, right? So like, just, just think about this. What a legacy. Just, I had to look up a company that's doing those kind of numbers. DoorDash <laughs> in 2019 did 850 million in revenue. So Picasso is where DoorDash was two years ago. Yeah. Picasso's laughing in the grave. <laughs> right. Man. Too bad, so that's just one that, too bad he didn't make that much money when he was alive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he was like a broke I, I artist, he, right? <laughs> no, I think he did okay for himself. Okay. Um, but that's just one artist. And they, they like to focus on the, these blue chip artists, which are their top 100. So mm -hmm. we're talking in the, the multi, multi billions a year. And, and if they're buying three to 400 million and they're the largest buyer, that, that there's, a, there's a lot of buyers out there. I, I think like the next 10 years is going to be I've been saying this outside of art, but I think the next 10 years will be the best 10 years ever in history to be an investor. You have, you have populations are still rising across the world. Technology is making labor and transactions at more efficient than ever. And capitalism still is still king in the world. And it's, those are the three things that have always grown the market over time. Now you have this, this, this kind of fourth dynamic of insane money printing and expansion of the monetary supply. And all that money is going to be landing in these in these assets, right? But before, like you just you weren't able to invest in so many assets. You had like a few asset classes to pick from. And now you have now you can invest in basically anything. Um, you know, we, we're talking about we're talking about art on this episode. And before you wanted to buy a Picasso, you could come up with like 15 million bucks, right? Right. Um, so now you can invest in art and then like we're talking about the same stuff with wine. You know, you can buy, you can buy a hundred thousand dollars worth of fine wine in a cellar and like not even touch it. And like, you, you know, you own it and you can flip it in 10 years. You can drink it. <laughs> like, I think all these things are going to go up. I, I think if you invest in, in safe, um, I think you invest in, in asset classes that have a history of appreciation over, you know, a 40, 40 plus t uh, year time frame you're going to do really, really well over the next 10 years, barring some major catastrophe. I think you're, it's going to be the best 10 years in, in history. And you can I, make more money. You can make more money investing in some, something really speculative. But I'm almost like, I think anyone who's got, who just invests in these solid asset classes and like um, even art, I mean, art is a very solid asset class, right? It's just not something that is top of mind for everybody. It's something that it's something that's new for the everyday investor. But if you look at its history, I mean, it's got a history as long as the stock market, right? Even longer. So even longer, you know, 250 years. I mean, you, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to argue when you, when you have a, a, a steady market for that long that it's going anywhere. Yeah. So these things I think are very solid. I think what Masterworks has done is, is pretty incredible. I would love to hear some feedback from our audience of anyone that's invested with Masterworks and what their experience has been. But Aside from this, you guys touched on NFTs, and I thought it was really interesting because it's again something that we haven't we haven't touched on. I'm sure we're going to do a dedicated episode in, in the months ahead. But I, I just started having conversations about NFTs recently, and uh, I wanted to get your thoughts, Derek, and have just a quick conversation on it. So you talked to Scott about about his opinion. Where you know where's your opinion, and how much digging have you done on NFTs? So I guess I wasn't super surprised that he, he thought this was a bubble and it wasn't going to sustain itself since he's so embedded in, in the physical art market. One thing that I was really surprised to learn. So I, I, I guess I just kind of assumed that if, if you own 
the physical painting, you own all the rights to it. So that really caught me off guard when he said, you know, any of the copyrights, uh, images or anything like that of these physical pieces of art, even though you own the actual artwork itself, you don't own any of the, any of the copyright use of it. So I think that in my head, I was like, Hey, why can't I make an NFT of this piece of art that I own and maybe, mm. uh, level up my investment while I can still look at the art hanging on my wall, which I found out that's, that's not possible because you don't own any of the copyrights. That's actually still belongs to the artists themselves. So even when these artists sell their own paintings, they're really not selling their paintings. They still own <laughs> technically the, the uses of their paintings. Well, what would happen in like the case of an NFT if if you took up a Picasso and then you create an NFT that's like eighty percent like that original painting, but it's not the original painting? Like, how much change you actually have to change it so that you don't avoid the copyrights? That's interesting. But then again, it, let's say it's you, Sam. It's it's a it's no longer a Picasso. It's it's Sam Mark's version of a Picasso. So what's the right. what's what's the value in that? I guess All right. So this is where I'm at with like the NFTs, right? People are going crazy. They're saying there's going to be this whole digital world and that digital world is going to be full of art and uh, and all that art's going to have value. And I, I get the I get the vision, right? One of my favorite movies, not because I think it's like this most fantastic movie, but it I think it, it's it's visionary, right? Actually, two, two movies that I'd like to talk about. One is Ready Player One and the other is Ex Machina or some people call it Ex uh, Machina or whatever. Um but Ready Player One, for anyone who's, who's watching it, if you haven't watched it, go out and watch it. I mean, it's basically a setting of everyone living in like small homes and um, and just playing on or just living in a, a virtual reality via their 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 uh, AR VR headset all day, right? And so they're living in this in this virtual reality, and the owner of the of the, uh, the environment within that resides within the virtual reality. Uh, it, it's like the most expensive, valuable company in the world, right? It's like a $5 trillion company. And um, and basically people just do whatever they can to allocate more and more time to just like being in that world. And they don't want to be in base reality. They want to be in the VR world. And I think a, that is is pretty accurate of where we're heading. For anyone that's put on an Oculus headset, it's it's an aha moment, right? And right. You, you, take off, you take off the headset and you're kind of like, you almost like deflated, like, Get me, get me back in there right yeah some of the environments that they've created in there are just insane so when you when you put on the oculus headset and you you play around in some of the the different environments and you watch ready player one like you get it right so then how does how does nft how do nfts play into that so you have i heard uh this from my buddy the other day it said that 13 billion hours were played on in gaming last year you know, it's wild yeah. people sitting around playing games. Like I, I haven't done it since high school, but it's like massive, but where's all the money being made? Like, so, so if you think of all those games, there's all these like digital worlds that have already been created. People are already living in these digital worlds. When you stare at your cell phone for six hours a day and your computer for 12 hours a day, like I got news for you. You're living in a digital reality. <laughs> like just right. because you don't have a headset on, you're still living in, in a digital reality. So think of how much how much we're already in the digital space. Every time you look at your phone or your computer uh, or play a video game, you're, you're you're looking at digital art to a degree. Um, and so, like when you look at gaming, all the money's made by whoever produces the game, right? But there's all these like artifacts and and art and things that are within these games that you know they're not individually valuable. Um, the, the so, problem I have is it's everything's easily duplicated. So what's so special about yours other than a talking point of saying, hey, I have the one, even though you have one that looks exactly the same as mine. Mm -hmm. Well, there's just going to be so much of this stuff, right? It's so so like if, you're in a, if you're in a digital world and you're looking at a painting in some mall uh, that you're, you're shopping in, like there's just no way that that painting is going to be worth four, $4 million. Sure. You know, is it going to be worth like $5? Maybe, <laughs> you know, but I, there's just going to be so much supply of this stuff that I can't see how most of these things are going to have any value at all. Yeah, I, I don't you see know? it and either. It's, it's, it's similar to like cryptocurrencies. I think you might have like one or two, and then there's just going to be this long tail of crap, of, of worthless crap that it gets speculated on and ultimately falls out. So maybe like the first NFTs or like some really famous artist comes along but um, 
Yeah, maybe some some more of the the historical that might have more of a historical presence, like like Jack Dorsey yeah. selling his first tweet, something like that. That's, yeah, there you go. I mean, this is where this is the exciting thing to me about physical art. It's not like going out and buying a piece of art from somebody that's alive right now. That has zero value to me unless it's like just really cool looking, and I think it's good art for the wall. Maybe maybe that's got a, a five hundred or a thousand dollar value or. I think that might go up in value over time because the artist is about to die. But what's really expensive is like, is the stuff that's 250 years old. It's old like Picasso's and these things that we're talking about. It gets everybody excited and there's, there's history around it all. So yeah, m- maybe NFTs um, in time, like 200 years, we're going to talk back to when like NFTs were first created and this digital revolution and tech re- revolution that we're going through. And some of this stuff will have value. Um, but who knows how it's going to play out, man. For sure, we're going to be living increasingly in, in the digital space going forward. And there's going to be all types of ways to make money in that digital space. I just think that the speculation of, of, of NFTs and, and cryptocurrencies to a degree, you know, there's going to be a lot of fast money made, but there's also going to be a lot of money lost. So. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't think NFTs are going anywhere necessarily, but their value cannot sustain where they're at for sure. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, one thing with art, though, that I do like, even though it is a physical object and, you know, you have to take care of it, you have to display it somewhere. The fact is the people buying this are displaying it in their home and everyone needs a home or a museum. Uh, Museums aren't going anywhere, no matter how digital we get, I don't think. So Mm -hmm. it's. It's not something that's antiquated. It's it's always going to have some sort of relevance, I think, because every every human needs needs a place to to live or just to stay, some kind of physical structure that they can put it in. The, that's not going anywhere. The display options for it, right? But if you own a Picasso, you're not keeping it in your uh, Los Angeles apartment, are you, Derek? <laughs> I think I'd, <laughs> it'd be a little nicer apartment, I think, but <laughs> I'm keeping it insured at a museum <laughs> and I want to be as far away from that as possible. <laughs> yeah. I, I seems especially like every my- week, seems like yeah. every, every week I ruin something in my apartment by spilling a glass of wine on it. So exactly. <laughs> They'd be like, what are, what are all these red dots all over this? I don't remember this in the original. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how that happens. Exactly. So, uh, and Masterworks, since we first talked to them too, has sold a couple paintings and they've had some really nice returns. So I think now we're kind of seeing the evolution of Masterworks and seeing it work and play that people are pursuing Masterworks because of the reputation and saying, hey, you have this painting and I want it. And like we said, these these people are going to pay, you know, top dollar for these these works. So what do you think that now that now that they're becoming more of a mature company and starting to get to the selling phase as well? that this is this is a good investment and they've started to prove themselves well i think one thing that that art has going for it right now is masterworks is effectively bringing liquidity to the market as a whole sure you know they're they're bringing in they have 200,000 investors that's 200,000 new investors into the art market more or less right and most of those are not going to be traditional art buyers that have been buying art for the last 20 or 30 years so i think that they're they're educating a lot of people about the market and they're bringing a lot of liquidity to the market and when you increase liquidity, you know, I think you're going to see you're going to see growth in that market, right? You have more people buying, more people interested in the asset. So I don't think art is going anywhere. I don't think it's it's at all going to get disrupted by NFTs. I think NFTs will create their own kind of additional um, additional supply and additional market, but I don't think it's going to take away anything from uh, from physical art. In fact, it could add value to physical art, right? Because it just increases the overall pie. So I, I like it. 14% over the last 25 years beats the S&P 500. Um, but even beyond that has a history. I mean, probably as, probably as long as, um, you know, ever since ancient Egypt, right? I'm sure they're selling art of, of some form and fashion, but contemporary art, uh, 14% growth over the last 25 years. I think Scott defined that as art uh, that was created after World War II. That's relatively new art. But yeah. Yeah, I like I like these episodes because learning a lot about like these kind of uh, these really interesting but historic asset classes. And uh, we need to line up another one on wine pretty soon because uh, it's it's that time of the year. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting to the fall. We need a nice glass of wine. Yeah. Summer's over. Time to start getting back into the reds. Pretty heavy. So I, I'm really excited for this fun that they're developing too because. Personally, I don't know a lot about these artists, but you know, I've heard of Banksy. He's telling me Banksy did 
growth last year, which is amazing. But you also run into that that issue that I brought up that it seems like everyone, no matter how great they seem or how nice of a person they seem, is getting canceled these days. It's crazy. So you could have someone's value just drop overnight from a bad headline. And that would really worry me about these living artists. So I, I think mm. I'm kind of with you with with the with the artists that are deceased that you know it's, it's a safer play. But I, I even even safer play beyond that, I think would be having them create a basket of a particular art uh, artwork from you know their top ten artists or whatever it may be. If they create this fun that they're looking into, I, I'm all on board with that. I think that's the safest play. Isn't like California? not showing John Wayne movies anymore because they're trying to change the name of the airport. His, he's got an airport named after him. They're trying to take his name off that. And yeah, there's some, there's some pretty dicey articles with him (laughs) as well. So maybe he's too current. He's too current. (laughs) You got to go back. uh, You got to go back to kind of uh, world war one, world war two. That's like anything from back then. It's like, you kind of get a free pass. Yeah. I feel like anything before a a TV existed, you know, you're probably pretty (laughs) safe. (laughs) All right. Well, interesting stuff. Good interview. Glad we got Scott back on and um, pretty fantastic to see what they've been able to build pretty quickly. And also really through COVID, I mean, three to, three to four times growth, even through COVID. Uh, that's, that's a pretty good sign. But we, let's definitely follow this. And again, listeners, if you've invested with uh, with Masterworks, talk about it in Patreon group or the or the boss on. We definitely want to hear more and see have uh, what kind of a growth that you've gotten in any of your investments, but also just how the, the experience has been on, on the whole. Yeah, definitely. And before we get out of here, I want to bring up our upcoming Boss Insider Series. So we're going to kick off our first call on September 9th. And also, if you want Scott to be a part of the Boss Insider, just let me know. We can reach out. I think it'd be a really good topic to have them on and get your questions in. So the way the Boss Insider works is it's only available to our iLab Patreon members can sign up at patreon.com slash invest like a boss as little as $5 a month. We're giving you direct access to the CEOs and heads of these uh, investment platforms that we've had on in the past. So you can ask questions directly. It's going to be a private zoom call and they're going to also present some updates on their company and new products. So our first guest is going to be empire flippers, capital, Mike Vrankovich. They have a brand new fund that they're going to debut just for iLab listeners. It's going to be really cool. You'll get to ask questions directly to him and it'll all be recorded too. So if you can't make the call live, we're going to post it in Patreon for anybody that misses it. I'm really excited for that. September 9th, it'll kick off. And like I said, if you got anybody you want to suggest like Scott or anyone else, hit us up in Patreon and we'll do our best to get them on this. I love this idea of Boss Insider and this is actually Derek's idea. So credit to Derek, uh, but we'll, we'll give you a pat on the back after the first one goes successful. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, also I, I do think Scott would be a fantastic guest to, to bring into that lineup as well. Well, with that said, if you want to learn more about Masterworks, they set up a special link for us. So they've been flooded with applicants. Like we said, they're over 200,000 investors now, which is wild, but... I worked out a little deal. They said, you can skip the line if you want, but you got to go to our link. It's masterworks.io slash invest like a boss. Masterworks.io slash invest like a boss. Scott said, if you fill that out, uh, it's a quick form. They're going to give you a call and they'll get you signed up to invest in shares as soon as possible. I actually have a quick idea before we, we hang up this episode. What if we got all the bosses together and we we bought one painting as a group? So Do you like that idea like, there? Like- we buy the, like all the shares available. Yeah. Ooh. Well, then I'm I, I'm gonna I'm gonna trust Scott because he's the expert. So I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna pick I'm gonna pick I'm gonna pick a Monet because that's what he's suggesting. All right. I'm gonna post this in the Facebook group and Patreons and see who would be interested in doing it. I think it could be it could be a lot of fun. Like an iLab exclusive painting. I like it. Yeah. And we travel to like wherever the museum to go see it. <laughs> Just an excuse to get together and have drinks. <laughs> yes, I lab meet up. Let's stare at our Monet. Keep Sam as far away as possible so he doesn't spill wine on it. I love it. All right, I'm making that post right now. I'm excited about this idea. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Uh, with that, I think we're going to get out of here, bosses. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.